Welcome to The Urban Monk. I'm Dr. Pedram Shojai, and today we're gonna to explore functional fitness. How do we find the best exercise to stay fit, avoid injury, and live longer? Only 40% of people exercise regularly, and of the ones that do, sports and exercise injuries are common. These pull us off the super highway of life, and they sideline us. So with injuries, we become idle, and we gain weight. Then we try to go back and we often hurt ourselves again because we don't know how to properly rehab. How do we break free of this cycle? We need to figure out what's missing here so that we can avoid the roller coaster. There's some new studies as well as some ancient techniques well worth your attention. So let's explore them and see if we can help find the best approach to exercise for you. So with us today is Dr. Tim Brown. He is the go-to guy for sports medicine in our world. He is an innovator, uh, treating sports injuries, keeping athletes doing what they're doing. And we're talking about NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, surfing, beach volleyball, uh, the who's who. Go to Dr. Tim Brown and you're about to find out why. Welcome. Oh, thank you, Petter. It's such an honor to be here and congratulations on the show. Thank you. Yours is the phone that rings when a top level athlete needs to be well. Your capacity to help these people is why your phone rings. So let's get into your philosophy a little bit. We are what we eat, think, and do. There's no way around that. So it allows us to kind of capsulize for each patient and look at them individually based upon what their activities are during their regular days. What do they do when they train? What do they do when they're not training? Are they sitting all day outside of training? What do they eat? Do they eat processed foods uh, that create a lot of inflammation? Are they into the organic row? Uh, what are they thinking? Are they in the moment or do they live in the future and they're constantly under stress? Or maybe they're someone who is very judgmental and that person tends to live in the past. So there's a lot of different ways to skin the cat. There's a lot of different great doctors and great philosophies out there that can help people. But what we try and do is to really put the responsibility back on the patient to educate them so that we see them less and they're taking care of themselves and participating in their own health care more. That is the, the song of the new functional health care model, right? Is it's not, you know, the mash unit. You know, oh, you broke, we're gonna right. fix you. And so your philosophy around the core and how training has been kind of off and what is now happening with it is really exciting. So let's, mm -hmm. let's first redefine the core, if you will. The core is uh, certainly a, a topic that is much talked about. It's not all about doing crunches. It's really about treating the core, the center of your body, which is actually from your diaphragm down to your knees. It's about treating that in the front, in the back, and on the sides equally. Just because we see the front doesn't mean that's the only part of the body that we need to train. We need to train in 360 degrees, where our core exists in the middle of our body. The core uh, is inherently weak and unstable. And in fact, the more unstable that area is, the more likely we are to have problems and pain, not just in our back, but in other parts of our body. So we found that by stabilizing or controlling the core area, we're able to actually treat the core like a, it's your car's transmission. Whether the energy is coming from the upper body or the lower body, it has to go through the transmission for that body to be translated along what we call the kinetic chain of movement. It's great because you get into these gyms and you get people just crunching away, you know, looking for their, their abs and all this. Right. And so we've been trained to think that way. And now you're working with all these professional athletes and there's this really different top-down version of thinking. And we sit on, on average at 9.2 hours a day in the United States. And when you sit, you know, your body runs on electricity. You know, when you move, you're creating electricity. When you stop moving, electricity dies or dims down. And when electricity is not getting to your cells and organs and tissues, it's basically becoming apoxic. It's dying of lack of oxygen and blood flow. And quite frankly, over time, that's what creates the wear and tear that ends up in an injury for most of us. Okay, so someone uh, went to school, played basketball, played baseball, did their thing. Then they got married, got a job, and mm -hmm. one day someone said, dude, you got 40 pounds on you. Right. And so they start running or they start bench pressing, what we call exercise. Right. What's the right way to look at how to get back in? Well, 
uh, it's great to start exercising. So movement is life and life is movement. So that's the bottom line here. If you move through life, you'll be very happy with your result. If you stop moving and sit at a chair and work for eight or 10 hours a day, the result's gonna be tragic. You're gonna lose the gift and the freedom that movement allows us to have. And so how we start these things is we recognize that there are three components to fitness, three main components. One is mobility, one is stability or coordination, the other one is strength. It's important that we first gain mobility before we start to do the other stuff. So first gain range of motion. So mm. it's really about reconfiguring that relationship that we had with our bodies when we were kids and we were rolling around in the dirt and just couldn't get enough, couldn't get enough activity in a day. And, and so is there a, a specific phasing? Like, so it's like, okay, first of all, you gotta loosen up, you gotta get your mobility. Right. And then the stability and strength kind of come hand in hand or are they in sequence? Well, some programs will do them in sequence. Other programs, which is one I'd love to, to bring up today, it's called foundation training. Foundation training integrates mobility, stability, and strength training all in the same movements. So for me, I, I'm, I like efficiency. Mm -hmm. And I frankly don't have the patience with myself a lot, self a lot of the time to do those yoga sessions that take many, many hours uh, to get where we want to get. So what I've done is I've worked foundation training into my training regimen and never been more satisfied. Uh, all this spiral talk reminds me of Qigong, it reminds me of Tai Chi, all these types of ancient practices. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that it sounds like these guys kind of had something and um, you know, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. let's go right. figure out what was there and how we can apply that to our bodies now. Right, I think it's, uh, we're, we're a bit too high tech for our own good sometimes. And sometimes when we find a scientific study, maybe we jump too hard and too fast into it. I really believe that you know, it's, uh, we're not born with doctors in our back pockets. I think we're born with an innate sense of what's right for us. And I think movement, if we really allow our bodies to do it, becomes a treasure to us because it just brings us so many opportunities. And as I mentioned before, when we lose movement, we lose freedom. And it's all about freedom. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about Qigong, it, it reminds me of uh, one of the systems I use called the Five Tibetan Rites. And it's been around, um, you know, it's, it's controversial in the sense that no one really truly knows their history. Um, but they believe it's about 700 years older than yoga is. And it was performed really to not just improve the outside of the body, but what was happening on the inside. It was, you know, the chakras. It's really about moving energy through those areas of our body where tension tends to build up and we tend to stop the energy flow. So the five Tibetan rites are really to open you up and they really, they call them the anti-aging exercises. I'm not sure if I'll go there, but it sure makes you feel great, Pedram. The first time I did it uh, was probably, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. And I knew that if I didn't do this every day, I was really cheating my body out of something special. So the five Tibetan rites, uh, is there a way we could just jump in and do that real quick? Can you show us that? Yeah, no problem. In fact, there's six, but we'll get into the sixth one later. We're only gonna do five today because I don't think you're ready for number six. Wow, drum roll please. All right, let's go there. All right, so Pedram, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the five Tibetan rites. We're gonna leave out the sixth one. We can talk about that later. But what we wanna do is we wanna start with three as a beginner. And each week you increase your repetitions by two. So the second week you're gonna do five repetitions of each five of these exercises, okay? Up to a certain number? Up to 21. Up to 21. Yeah, All so right. it takes a lot of dedication to get up to 21. But be patient, take your time, enjoy it. Every time you're doing it, you're doing something that's really healthy for your body. Excellent, excellent. Okay. Well, let's get into it. All right, man. well, let's get some oxygen going to these muscles. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to work with my inner ear for balance. So we're going to do some spins. And it's just like the whirling dervishes do, uh, except for the hand position is different. So I'll go over a couple positions on the hands. Choose the one that feels best for you. Okay? Okay, great, right. yeah. All right, we start facing straight ahead. Lock your eyes into a spot on the wall. Turn your hands up or down or one up or one down, depending on what just feels right for you. I'm gonna start this way and just spin three times. One, two, three. So what you should feel now is probably a little bit dizzy. As you start to do this more often, you'll get less and less dizzy. Number two. Flat on the ground, we're gonna go for the chakra down low here. 
and we're going to stimulate it by bringing blood to that area. So breath in, bring your head off the floor, that protects your low back. Now bring the legs up, breath is held in, pressing down with the fingertips, you really feel it in your stomach and lower abs. And then slowly let the breath out as you let the legs down. And again, three reps of each of these. So you're creating compression and really strengthening the lower abdomen here with breath. Correct. I'm using my diaphragm to create pressure in my abs that contracts the muscles as my legs are coming up as well. So we're getting it from both sides. Fantastic. Okay. Okay. And then the third exercise is on the knees. You're going to breathe in. Let the head drop back, open up the chest, and then lean back from the knees. And you're going to feel a tremendous amount of stretch right through the front of the thigh. That means it's working. Breath out. Back to start. Breath in. Leaning backwards. It's interesting how these, all the ancient practices always incorporate the breath. Breath is key. And now they're just starting to recognize how important it is in core training. Mm -hmm. Number four, it's called the tabletop. And it's really good for those that have to sit a lot during the day because it opens up all the hip flexors and the muscles in the chest. So it's really simple uh, in form, but it may be difficult for those that haven't tried it before. So if you're new to these exercises, take your time. You don't have to be successful and get the hips all the way up to 90 degrees. Do what you can do. Keep it comfortable. Don't push yourself through pain. It's not that kind of exercise. Mm -hmm. All right, so deep breath in. Push up off the ground. Pull the legs into the tabletop position. Let the head drop back. Now you're going to push down with the heels. Squeeze your butt. Squeeze your shoulder blades together to allow that head to really drop back. And now back into the beginning position. Breath in, come on up, push the hips up, let the head drop back, big squeeze with the butt, big squeeze with the shoulder blades, and all the way down. You should be down in that position for, or up in that position for about a full breath, maybe seven to 10 seconds if you can, okay? Now, number five, it should be pretty familiar with you. It looks kind of like yoga moves, and what you're doing is you're taking a deep breath in, letting it all the way out, and then pushing yourself up into what we call a modified cobra position with the hips off the ground. Only lift the hips off the ground if it feels comfortable for you in the back. Take a breath in and push yourself up into downward dog position. Really try and push those arms back and all the way down. Breath in. All the way out, push yourself up, breath in, press back, push the heels towards the ground, all the way back down. Seems like work. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely gets your body heat up, Pedram. It's, uh, you're working out against your own muscle imbalances. And what's inside those muscles, there's energy that you haven't used up. Mm. And when you try and stretch that energy, it really builds up body heat. So mm. that's why you see me leaking a little bit right now. <laughs> you know what I also see is a little uh, secret weapon you got <laughs> over there. Do you mind sharing this? Yeah, no problem at all. Yeah, let's see it, man. Yeah, it's, uh, it's based upon a taping technique I developed in the 80s. And it uh, is basically teaching your body how to stand better. It's interfacing with the nervous system in your body through the skin, through muscle attachment and acupressure points. I've been able to kind of harness the body's energy. And just like with uh, the body's golden ratio and the Fibonacci sequence, what we're doing is we're basically taking energy and we're organizing it mm. in the same way that the universe does. Can we, uh, can we show this yeah, thing sure. off? So Explain, explain what's happening here. Yeah, well, we're normally very tight in the front. And when we're tight in the front, we slump forward. And what these panels do is they stimulate the muscles in your back to not allow you to slump. Huh. They actually switch the muscles on so that you become stronger and you stand taller, sit taller, move taller, 
and it teaches your body how to hold itself in a more energy efficient way. Okay, so important distinction. It's mm -hmm. not a brace pulling you back, it's making your body work. Exactly, it's not a brace. That would really be doing a disservice where your body would become dependent on it and it would actually atrophy and get weaker by you wearing it. Mm -hmm. This is a workout to wear. And in fact, even for athletes, it might take a week or two to get fit enough to be able to wear it for mm -hmm. as many hours as we suggest. So it's like a mini workout every time you put it on. So again, it's one of those things that you can do to carve off some of that seven and a half hour a week workout right. protocol by wearing something that makes you look better, feel better, and perform better. So I love the, the ancient old, you got the Fibonacci sequence into a fiber that we can wear every day and, and keep ourselves moving. Right. For the average person who's got seven and a half hours of movement to make up, we got the five Tibetan rites. Mm -hmm. We got this type of, of postural technology, if you will. And so I know you got a surprise for us. So yeah. what do we got? You bet. We're going to go down to the beach and we're going to spend some time with a couple incredible professional athletes. One that just retired from the pro surfing tour that's still in incredibly great shape, surf some of the world's biggest waves. And then we're gonna switch over and we're gonna work with a gal that's on the women's beach volleyball tour. Uh, her aspirations are many. One is uh, she wanted to be an attorney and she got that done. Now she wants to go to the Olympics and represent the United States. So we're gonna go watch them work out a little bit and show you what some of these exercises can really do for you. Uh, whether you're a professional athlete or someone who just wants to stay fit and healthy, there's something for everyone. Excellent, let's go there. Okay, we're on the deck of Dr. Tim Brown's house with Lauren Fendrick. Welcome, nice to see you. Thank you, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you, thanks for having us. Good to see you, Pedro. Yeah, excellent. So, Lauren, you are in the running for beach volleyball right now, going for the Olympic team, and uh, you've had a path to get here. Your journey has led you through some injuries. Give us a, a brief uh, history of how you are working to get there with these injuries. Well, I've been playing volleyball um, for about 20 years, I'm playing beach volleyball for about 10 years now. So it's a right hand dominated sport and uh, you rotate one direction uh, every time you swing at the ball. So that creates a lot of imbalances and um, uh, I had an injury on top of that. Um, I injured my left knee in uh, 2005 and had ACL reconstruction. And so since then I've been having to maintain, do rehab, have, um, you know, experts like Tim work on it and help keeping me healthy and firing on all cylinders. It takes a lot of different experts, a lot of different specialties to help someone with a gal with this level of talent to get back. No one knows it all. And so everyone has a piece to add to her puzzle that'll allow her to gain better control over the issues that she has. Because there's really no cure, but there's control. And if we can give her the tools to be able to control the problems and allow her to go out and play as hard as she can play, uh, she'll go out and she'll be able to dominate. Fantastic. So there's a lot of jumping, there's a lot of diving, there's a lot of everything in your sport. Yeah. So uh, are there any particular moves that are challenging uh, with the injuries or is it all just kind of trying to keep it all working? <laughs> it's all challenging. I don't know if you've been out in the sand, but even just, you know, walking can be challenging. So. <laughs> Put jumping on top of that, um, there's a lot of change of direction, quick change of direction. Um, so yeah, all those dynamic movements. So I'm assuming there's a balance. There's mobility, there's stability, and then there's strength. Which of those is the most challenging for you in the training regimen? I mean, forget about the volleyball and all the other stuff, the stuff he puts you through. Yeah. Which, which is the most challenging and feels the most awkward to your body? Um, I think it depends. Um, generally, I'm a pretty strong person, so I would say that would maybe be third, but um, sometimes it's the mobility and sometimes it's the stability. Mm -hmm. Is there any specific mobility stability that you guys do for beach volleyball um, that's uh, sports specific that you're working on? Or is it generally to get her in super shape to be able to do anything? Yeah, it's more because it's, so, it's such a diverse sport. And there are certain areas that we'll all pick off on each player that they can work on to tune themselves up. But really what we're trying to do is make it as easy on Lauren's body as possible. We're trying to connect the mobility, the stability, and the strength into one unit. And that's basically connecting her breathing, her eyesight, her balance in her middle ear, her skin. Everything is connected into this program. That's really what you know is the challenge, is trying to make all that happen and on the right date 
so that it's showing up when you're playing and not the day after. <laughs> totally. How long from the time of this recording to the Olympics? Year and a half. Yeah? Yes. And so uh, what, what is it like for an Olympic athlete knowing that the big show is a year and a half away? Well, I've still got to qualify, so I have my first qualification tournament coming up in about a week. So I, my focus is on that tournament and, you know, actually just trying to stay present and uh, work through the journey and enjoy the journey because, you know, I can't control what the outcome is going to be. So Dr. Tim Brown and I are out here at the beach, Newport Beach, California, with Taylor Knox, who's a legend in the surfing world. And we're going to talk about what it takes to be fit with all the injuries and stuff you've had. Hey, great to see you. You too. Thanks yeah, for having me on. Tim, Good to see you, brother. See you again. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. Taylor, man, you've had injuries and you've had them for a long time and you've been on the tour pretty much as long as anybody. <laughs> And so, what have you been doing to stay fit and be able to continue to surf at such a high level? Oh, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, I was pushed into working out. I had no choice, you know, after my back surgery. So, it, it was all about kind of getting everything around it really strong. So, I, you know, I started off with basically going to the gym, not knowing what I was doing, moving into doing some yoga early on, really helped stretch out some of my, my back muscles and stuff that got tight. And then, uh, just more you know, like sophisticated kind of Swiss ball training where you're balancing a lot and uh, also dabbled in foundation training some. I, I like to mix it up. I don't have one particular type of training that I sold on 100%. It's just like I dabble in everything kind of thing. He was a, one of those guys that connected it all together early. As he, as he mentioned, he's very open in his approach. But he also has a very great innate sense of what's right and what's wrong for him. Fantastic. And I mean, your daily routine sounds like you mix up and you do all sorts of things. But at the end of the day, this is your love. Right. This is the reason you do it all. It's all worth it. That is all worth it, you know, all the time spent. And, uh, you know, I, I try to say pretty much the one constant thing I have when I wake up every morning is I, I like to do my Keeley meditation. You know, I do a little for 10 or 20 minutes because I. I've learned that the, the body follows the mind, you know, like, and I've, I've overtrained and I've done all, I mean, you know, I've tried everything, think a lot of things that didn't work. So, you know, at the end of the day, it was more about how I felt and then did I feel good about what I was doing. You can have the best body in the world, but if it's not connected to your mind and there's no flow there, there's going to be injury and there's going to be poor performance. When you connect those things, when there's no question between the two, the body flows with what the mind wants. So the old days of bench pressing and running marathons have taken us into a direction that has probably injured us. And between the Tibetan rites and all we learned about posture and balance and looking at functional training, I feel like we learned something very important today. You gotta go at your own pace, don't hurt yourself. This is about getting functionally fit so that you can move and keep moving. I want to hear from you about what you plan to do to get functionally fit and stay that way in our social channels. And for the Urban Monk and all of us, this is Dr. Pedram Shojai, and I will see you soon. Mm -hmm.